everyone. My name is James, uh, host of this session. Today we have Niraj. He will be holding this tutorial on a topic that is uh, increasingly crucial in the landscape of machine learning and artificial intelligence, in expandable AI. And this session is designed for those who are new to the domain, are keen to unravel the black box that often characterize the uh, learning model. So as we integrate AI system into critical areas like healthcare, finance, and autonomous driving, the need of the transparent and under understandable algorithm has never been greater. So if you ever wonder how we can trust the machines that are become an integral part of our lives, you are in for a treat. So let's give a warm welcome to Niraj. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, so I'm Niraj, and today we're gonna be talking about explainable AI. So before we start, I have a quick question for you all. How many of you guys are from the background of machine learning or something similar to that? Anything related to data science? So how many of you knows how to make a simple regression model or something? Okay, so <clears throat> the thing is like we have only 90 minutes. So in this tutorial, we won't be focusing a lot on learning what the algorithm do like Actually, I won't be explaining you how you how a random forest works. Actually, the workings and all. I'll give you a brief, but like the main focus will be interpreting those models. Like how if 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 we applaud a linear regression or a logistic regression, how we can interpret the inner workings of that model. But yes, definitely, if you if you want to like talk more about something like EBMs and all, talk to me after the session. So yeah, so just like bear with me. We'll we'll, we'll have, we will go somewhere after this. So, <clears throat> okay, so to begin, so the, to the tutorial outline will be, we'll start with what exactly is explainable AI or interpretable AI, and what's the significance and the need for using explainable AI, and what is a model complexity and the interpretability trade-off which is happening, and why people are now getting more used to it. So there are different factors we'll be discussing. Then we'll be going to the explainable AI methods and types. Like there are so many, but like we'll be covering the mostly vastly used models and the types which are there in the market. And then we'll be having a break for like 10 minutes so that you guys can set up these Jupyter notebooks and all in your system if you want to follow along. And then we'll be proceeding with a hands-on session. We'll be seeing how we can in, uh, implement the inter uh, this uh, interpret ML Lime Sharp explainer dashboards and PDP values. So the first thing which is like, what is explainable AI? So there's, a, there's, there's always a confusing thing which says like, people always correlate like uh, interpretable AI, interpretable machine learning and explainable AI. But like at its core, if you just like dig deep into the technology, the terminology, you will see like, it aims to provide a suite of techniques that helps us uh, validate how our machine learning algorithms are performing. And to be uh, precise, it's a way to, we can, um, we can focus on demystifying the black box and what's a black box we'll see later. And it aims to answer us like more or less with a toolkit of techniques and uh, that brings clarity to the models. So to, to understand this in a bit of detail, Let's, let's assume you, you, you have a machine learning model which does something like a healthcare support, healthcare decision support, and you have a predictive model that determines patient risk for conditions like diabetes, heart failure, or cancer. And as our machine learning models are like increasingly being used in this area of healthcare and finance and all other domains, the decision they make can be very much um, like uh, altering consequences and all. So understanding why and how they're coming to a decision at getting crucial, it's, there are two aspects of it. One is it's a, it's to build a relationship with the customer and uh, the, the owner who's like the healthcare systems here. And the second one is the legalities like the GDPR, which is in the Europe. So then we see like why it's needed, which I just said, like doctors need to understand why a model makes a certain prediction. 
because they also need to have a clear understanding of why they're saying and not something a machine learning model is just like taking some biases on the basis of maybe some um, some different aspects could be any kind of features it could be a bias in uh, gender or anything and the total overall benefit is the increased trust and the actionable insights so overall in this tutorial I uh, will explore these methods by which we, they will help us validate our machine learning models and to understand properly this another example which is like assume there's an autonomous vehicle like self-driving cars like they're making decisions and we also don't want a machine learning model to completely change its prediction on the basis of a small change maybe something like there's a change in the sensor we don't want to just like the the the, the, the output is completely terribly changed so the engineers and regulators need to understand like how these decisions are made so that they can tweak all the details in, in accordance to the safety standards. And that's another example like in the financial fraud detection which is more or less people learn the first when they're studying machine learning like fraud detection and all and it helps us like flagging your initial transactions so in the financial domain it's a massive hit like people are continuously using explainable ai to uh, open up their black box models so that like they can identify a suspicious activity and why those activity has been flagged because if you have been flagged by your bank account like for the suspicion activity you should know like why exactly you have been flagged. because if you, if you know like how many of you have like gone for a visa appointment and something and most of the time if you apply for x country you get a you get a letter saying hey uh you don't satisfy these conditions which is the broad condition of five statements and choose one of them by your own so that's the thing like you should know like where exactly the the model is just like giving a hit like hey this is a suspicion transition so to talk about the black box dilemma so it's more or less uh, defined to describe complex machine learning models. So for example, if you're using something like a very simple model like logistic regression or um, something like a um, linear regression or uh, what do we say that decision trees, which are pretty simple. On those models, we don't consider them black box because we know the inner functioning. But if you're using a deep neural network or a CNN where there are like so many hidden layers, you just know the input and the output. What's exactly happening, you just know the math, but like what exactly happening at each step, you can't figure out. You're just like trusting the uh, AI system. So you have four aspects for this. One is like the consequences of complexity, which is like, all your complex models like the deep learning or the ensemble models like random forest which compiles different um, ml algorithms together are like pretty highly accurate but like they're very hard to interpret so for those we have specific uh, model based uh, libraries and some agnostic libraries we'll be discussing later on and the second one is like the simplicity sin of the code. Like even though these models are very easy to uh, interpret, but they are not covering all the nuances in the data. So the only trade-off it's like <clears throat> some of the approaches manages to you know balance this complexity and the nuance thing, like the interpretability, uh, like the ensemble methods, but they are pretty complex to to interpret eventually. And then you have the post hoc interpretability, which actually works for these kind of neural networks and ensemble methods like random forest we'll be seeing later. And these are two of them are the mostly common use, the in industry standards, which are Lime and Sharp. So Lime is for specifically for the local interpretation and Sharp is for both. And we'll see like what after this uh, slides, like how we can use Lime and Sharp all together in our code base. So if you see this graph, you see like this is an accuracy versus interpretability graph. You'll see like the classification rules, which are very simple to uh, interpret, but are the, the accuracy is very low as compared to deep neural networks or ensemble methods like random forests or SVMs. So in this session, what we'll be saying is like in the interpretable, the normal methods, which are directly interpretable, which are not black box, which are considered white box or the glass box which you can see the inner functioning will be taking care of the decision trees linear regression uh, will be taking logistic regression which is another step of linear regression and the 
classification tools on basis of it. And for the model agnostic methods, we'll be saying neural networks and random forest. So just to give you another scenario on to deeply understand black box, because I want you guys to have a clear understanding before we actually go into the hands-on session after this uh, presentation. It's like, let's assume there is a healthcare again, is there's an AI model which classifies a patient is at high risk or not. But the stakes here are very high because doctors are making some life altering decisions based on the predictions. However, trust is a huge barrier here and doctors are unlikely to trust a black box model as they need to explain the, uh, eventually the patient, like why this thing is happening and how confident they are. So when they're applying some sort of an explainability techniques, we can dissect the model's inner functioning and we can get some specific features like, hey, how much is the blood pressure is like contributing to this thing? How much is your lifestyle changes or genetic changes are contributing to your eventual output of the machine learning model? So this doesn't only like build a trust, but also gives you an in, like an uh, actionable insights, which you can use to make your AI systems better. Similarly, you have the loan approval system. There's <coughs> there's a huge conflict in the loan, li like the banking industry, where there's a huge bias all the time, where people are complaining like, hey, my uh, score has been two times better than this other person, and why I'm rejected by the system and the other guy has been not. So th there's always a conflict, like there are so many biases happening in the black box, like no one knows how it's working. They just know the output is like, hey, you are rejected. So we'll see an, uh, an examples of like how we use lime to uh, get lime and sharp to get the overall factors which are contributing to an acceptance of a loan, and what are the local interpretations which are like specific factors which are contributing to you getting a loan or it's being rejected. So there are like one last thing before we actually get into lime and sharp is like the imperatives for explainable AI. Like why are we using it now? Because why do we care? We have just built a model and just like deployed it. It's working completely fine. We're making money or solving issues. So there are a couple of things which is like fairness, privacy, reliability, causality, trust and legal compliance. Legal compliance is a major factor which is driving this now. And if we just like start with the impartiality, you will see like uh, we have a lot of biases happening. On the, on, the, on the terms of like genders and everything. For example, you will see like when you're applying for a university, the pretty, the event, the eventually the, the verdict on your application could have some biases. Doesn't matter, we're not talking about the AI system, but like in general, there are biases. And if you're just like feeding those things into your machine learning models, the outputs are gonna be on the basis of those biases. So there's a need for those un, unbiased predictive models specifically like the example we saw before because throughout this we'll see three examples education health and um, this thing um, the banking the financial one so um, we don't want a health risk prediction model that inaccurately assesses the risk levels for a particular racial group it should be solely based on the reports not like where you're coming from the second one is like the data confidentiality um, I'm not saying any specific country, but like there are countries where the confidentiality is not a thing and <laughs> we need to secure the information. And why? Because if a model is giving some score, like your banking system is providing you a loan, it should not be just like taking account of your personal history and everything in order to give you a loan. It should be solely on basis of those five or six factors they have mentioned initially, like these are the factors by which we, we give the loan out. And specifically, uh, similarly in the healthcare, we don't want <coughs> to diagnose diseases which keeps like personal data. We just want them to keep everything anonymous, just like the GDPR we'll be seeing further. And the third last is like the model stability. This is a very crucial thing because uh, we don't want something like any small modifications are just like driving drastic changes. For spe this specific model, uh, this specific uh, thing, we have PDPs where you get like what specific metric, like the feature is gonna change and gonna make some drastic change eventually in the model and how much percentage change is gonna see. So we'll all see uh, in the hands-on how it's gonna work out. And we also need a uniform behavior because 
we don't want some model to give you, for example, for five times it says like you're having just cold and the sixth time it says, hey, you have COVID now. Mm -hmm. So we want a uniform model and for that we need to know how the inner function is it's working. And then, uh, then the last, second last is like the cause and effect. As we say, like correlation does not imply causation. Like if you, there's a common saying which says, going sleeping with shoes on gives you a headache in the morning. But like there are so many different factors. Maybe you were drunk last night. So, <laughs> so, so, so just saying like correlation is implying the causation is wrong. And many machine learning models like are built on these statistical correlations that might lack real world meaning. So and this can lead to like some misleading uh, prediction and these are something which is very common. And most of the time they are just like considered as like, hey, there, there's an imbalanced data sets and there's like so many outliers happening. And so there are two aspects for this, like why understanding causality is important because there's like, um, if we are able to understand this thing, then we are gonna make some robust decisions. For instance, like saying smoking can cause health issues. Um, we can say like smoking is correlated with health issues, but it's not the main cause for it. Like if you're having a bad health, or if you say like, hey, if there's like crime rates are increasing high and people are buying more ice creams, we can't just like say, hey, people are just like committing crime because they're buying so many ice creams out there. And just to finish it off, we have user confidence. It's like, there should be a trust if you're using some AI models, like in the pandemic time, we also worked with some machine learning models which were predicting COVID RT-PCR test directly for people, but they were blindly trusting the models even though the accuracy was like 88% or 90%. For the people who don't even understand how those two lines mean, they were just like looking at their phones, clicking the photos and saying, oh, it works. And people who were working behind them were like, oh, there's an open CVR or an, uh, cloud computer vision model working on it. It's working somehow. It's giving us the output. We don't care how it's working. And the last one is the <coughs> lawful accountability, like the GDPR and the legal requirements. I mean, every single country is like, like slowly and slowly like adopting these things. But like Europe is like one of the countries where GDPR is so strong. Like every even the AI companies have to disclose how, what, and how they are doing. And explainable AI ensures that the systems can be held accountable and thus they meet the legal requirements. So, <clears throat> so there are like two major explainable AI models we'll be discussing. One is like a model specific and one is the model agnostic. So model specific is something which is if there's an interpretability library made specifically for your specific models, there is a downside and an upside both for this. We'll, we'll, we'll see after, this, uh, a few, after a few slides, like what are those? And in the model specific, we will take into account the logistic regression, decision trees, and the explainable boosting machines. So this is an algorithm specifically designed by Microsoft, and we'll see like how it works as well. And then you have the model agnostic, which are something which works for a broad level of uh, different machine learning models. And you have two different types of explanations over there. One is the local interpretable model agnostic models and the global ones. And to see them in action, we'll see you make use of the random forest, CNN, and some transformers to m see like how we can open them up and see how much uh, proportion they are just like contributing to the eventual model. So to, to understand the scopes of the models, we are, the libraries we're using, we have two major ones. One is the global explanations, and the second one is the local explanations. So to understand the global one, we can say, uh, imagine you are a data scientist wanted to understand something like your general behavior of your newly deployed model on the cloud or something. And it's based on something like a loan approval system. So global explanations will help you do something like uh, giving you a bird's eye on what are the factors which evaluates your loan for every specific uh, individual or the application it's trained on. And this is like very crucial for like fine tuning the models and making adjustments on a broad level. And then you have the local explanation which are focused on something very local, which like as the name suggests like localized version. 
You can, under the um, create and inference, something like picture the loan officer from the same department. Now, instead of thinking of those broad spectrum of factors which are contributing, you can think of like why your specific loan application was rejected by the model. So the local explanations will provide you like, specific insights on the uh, specific metrics, like how much your credit score contributed, how much your past uh, maybe transfers and everything contributed, how much your income level contributed, and so on. So in the global explainability, you have three different factors. One is like the feature importance. So feature importance is something carried out through uh, permutations, like giving us a rank list of things, like which factors goes up, which factors comes the least. And you can think of an understanding in a way like uh, which uh, in in your university, which exam contributed, which which specific was subject contributed to your final grade, and eventually define your studying strategies. Like here, this this is the factor I should be studying more. And then we have the partial dependence plots, the PDPs I talked about earlier. So these are like graphical representations of giving you a correlation, which is something like um, how a single feature influences your model's overall predictions. So it's like seeing like um, how your sleep quality impacts your performance throughout the month. So you, you can say like, if I'm sleeping less, uh, my REM cycles are changing, so eventually my eventual performance is changing. So that could be one of the very small factor which is just bringing a drastic change. And the lastly is like uh, something like the logistic regression with regularization. So these models are straightforward interpreted because we know like, uh, uh, I'm just saying, if you don't know, it's fine. You can Google it up later on, we'll, or maybe chat with me. So it's based on the weights. So if a weight is just like directly contributing to your uh, feature, and because their coefficients like directly uh, indicate their feature importance, we can say like we can clearly understand what is happening at what step. And if you still don't understand the weights in layman terms, we can say like. Uh, if you're trying to predict the housing prices and the coefficient for the square foot price will tell you the impact of the overall price. So those are the weights, the coefficients which are just like driving the change in the overall features. And then you have the local explainability which has LIME which is called the local interpretable model agnostic explanation. That's a long name. <laughs> I have to see the screens for that. And for example, for a specific person who was denied loan for by the loan officer, this method can uh, explain like why there are uh, what specific parameter in their employment status met the threshold or didn't meet the threshold, and or maybe their poor credit history was the one deciding factors in their eventual denial. Because we'll see in the code like a single parameter can completely push the positive to the negative one. And then you have the counterfactual uh, explanation. So they tell us the minimum changes to flip the uh, model's overall outcome, like overall decision. For example, if a model rejected a loan application, so this counterfactual application can might reveal like how much a small value could have added to your salary. Maybe your salary was like 100,000 for a year, and maybe if you would have just added five more thousand somehow, you would have got the loan. So those are the things what counterfactual explanations tell you. And the last one is the SHAP, the Sharpley value. This is the most powerful tool out there, which is often used for the global interpretation more or less, but like we can also use it for the local interpretations as well. And for example, if you are a doctor diagnosing a disease, Sharpley can tell you the symptoms and how much symptoms contributed to some specific disease. For example, in your COVID, if you had COVID, like how much of your symptoms are actually contributing to your worse health right now? And <clears throat> so this is the last topic we'll be talking before we go to the hands-on. So your model could be either model specific or model agnostic. So model specific are basically the interpretability techniques that are uh, customized to work on close uh, <coughs> work on something like uh, on the machine learning models, which are glass box, which you know they're in a functioning happening, and they are like custom made tailored uh, to fit unique characteristics of a specific model, a model, uh, uh, 
a, 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 a model which is working with something like a regression model m might m won't work with something like a classification or some other machine learning algorithm. And the thing is like model agnostic are brown, like a broad spectrum and they are less effective, but they have a high accuracy. And the advantage is like if you they dig deep into the internals of a specific algorithm. If you're using a model agnostic, they won't go as deep as the ones which are the model specific ones are going because they take into account the unique properties of every single uh, feature of that model. And the last thing we have is they help us to extract the nuances in the specific code, like uh, what our model is doing at a very low level, and th then it will help us to understand the deeper understanding of the same uh, model. The first one will be the logistic regression. So for those who don't know, if you see the graph, <coughs> it's like it's, it's a simple statistical method and which has one or more independent variables, and it's used for classification, the binary classifications to be precise. If you see the uh, equation, we, where P is the basically the probability of the dependent event occurring, the B0 is the intercept where it's cutting the graph, and the B1, B2 are the coefficients, which are the independent variables to X1, X2, and so on, and they are the ones which drive the change, and E is basically nothing but the natural log logarithm. What this algorithm does, it's similar to linear regression, but it squashes the value between 0 and 1. If you see the graph, it, it squashes the value between 0 and 1, so it makes it more interpretable as a probability. And this is like crucial for classification stars because you want to, you want to have a probability between 0 and 1. And one uh, last thing I want to say is like the positive coefficients. Like um, if there is like one plus one plus one change in the coefficient like uh, the B1, that'll increase the log outs of the response, like they'll bring in the change of by one in the X1, and the negative coefficient decreases the log, uh, like log outs of the response here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it about logistic regression, and if you want to see <coughs> A real life example, we can say like, if you want to predict something like a customer churn scenario, which means like how many customers I'm gonna lose very soon, and we have a scenario which says a telecom company wants to predict which customers are likely to leave for another competitor. So we can figure out something like, um, if the coefficient for the contract length is negative, it means the, uh, the longer the contract stays, the customers is likely will churn. And what this insight will be giving us is like, when you know all these details, we can help the company that proactively take steps to make sure like they retain the high risk customers because they don't care about the low risk customers anymore. They'll eventually stay. The second one is the decision trees. Um, this is the most easiest algorithm to understand. So what it's doing, it's like, <coughs> it's like normal if else statements. It takes like, it goes down a tree structure, says like if this condition is met, you go left, if it doesn't met, you go right. Left, right, and eventually comes to the, um, the level which actually satisfy all your requirements and that's your output. And yeah, it's, it's a hierarchical decision making. It breaks down your complex decisions into simpler decisions and it's very transparent. That's why it's, it's a part of the white box and it's easily to visualize as well. And to understand like the, an example will be like the credit risk analysis, like a bank wants to decide if they wants to offer a loan to the individual. So we can consider something like a tree interpretation where the node splits on annual income and one of its child notes contains something like a uh, credit score. Like if, if your income is satisfied, then we go to the credit score and so on. It's just like a hierarchy and it can help like the bank to tr like transparently understand which factors are cr critical in assessing their loan applicants. And the last one is EBM. We'll just like touch it a bit because to explain this, this is like pretty complicated. It will take like 20 minutes to just l understand explainable boosting machines. So it's a type of a generalized additive model. What it means, it's like it's easily interpretable. It's, it's made by Microsoft's interpret ML team just to make sure like this model is easy to interpret by them. And it creates a one directional uh, histograms uh, which is designed to be interpretable. That's why uh, 
it, it, it is uh, meant to be interpretable. And what happening is like each feature over there, each feature over there is modeled individually and later combined in to make predictions. So unlike black box, the EBMs allow the feature importance, like uh, the whatever the important feature here is, and then visualize it better to understand. And how we can interpret is like, uh, we use the PDPs, the partial dependence plots, because it helps us like if there's like a specific factor driving, what are they gonna be eventually doing for the predictions and affect the predicted outcomes. And we will we'll see them um, properly in the hands-on. And because this is pretty new, not many people know about it, so how it works is like you have the first step where you initialize, and what you do is like we initialize the model um, with a naive prediction class. This is like usually the class prevalence in the data set. Then you have the second one is like feature scanning. What we do is like the algorithm scans through each feature one by one to find the best fitting decision stump. Uh, a stump could be a one level decision tree. It could be, uh, but it's, it's a one level decision tree here. But like in, if you're working with a similar algorithm, you can switch to something else. Uh, something similar, just like histograms, which you saw in the last screen. Then the third step is like the boosting step where the small decision stump learned is added as an ensemble model which scale down by a learning rate to we, we scale it down to avoid overfitting uh, basically and then we have the residual update because there has been a residual left so the prediction errors we, in our case so they are recalculated based on the model's current prediction so if you know if you have worked with genetic algorithms in the past or knows how genetic algorithms work, it works in a similar manner. It just says like the fitness is there, it just goes back, recalculates it and gets the better one or something like a black hole algorithm. Like we take something like the inspiration from the stars, this is a black hole, but like if we found new, newer black holes coming in, we just like tweak them in the next iteration. And then we uh, iterate from step two to four iteratively and each time we choose like um, a new feature and a new learning rate. And yeah, then we stop once our iterations are the criteria is met. So that's how the explainable boosting machine works. And this is like a small example, like healthcare risk prediction, which predicts the likelihood of a patient getting a particular disease. And this can help you get the features like the age, BMI, um, blood pressure maybe, or anything like any, any factor which can individually contribute to the uh, uh, increased risk. Then you have the local, okay, did we cover this? No. So yeah, model uh, model agnostic methods. So this method is like a Swiss army knife for interpreter. It, it has like multiple features, like multiple things can do by its own. And it's designed to work on any machine learning model, like any machine learning model. I mean, more or less almost everyone. I mean, ma saying all is like, uh, diff uh, it's, it's a long term, but like almost all, I would say. And it's uh, not tied to the internal workings, like it's not going deep into the internals of how a machine learning algorithm is working, but it works on the specific representations. It's highly versatile, which means like it can interpret from very simple machine learning models to from like linear regression to highly complex deep neural networks. And uh, for the model agnostic, the examples would be Lime, Sharp, and PDP, which we already discussed, PDPs we already discussed. And why they stand out is because they have a wide accessibility and wide uh, applicability across different complex um, uh, models. So the two, two, three things, which is like, we are just left, left with one, Lime, Sharp, and PD, PDP. So Lime is basically so to understand Lime, uh, we won't go into the mathematics behind this because that's way too complicated to teach, like to learn over here. So you can l understand something like, um, you have a model which just builds a decision, a boundary on a 2D plane or a 3D plane, whatever plane it is. And you see like there are so many points being, some example could be, 
if a person has diabetes or if a person has not diabetes. So it can either plot something like uh, diabetes, non-diabetic, diabetes, it just classifies. But what the problem is like, how can you interpret? So what line does is like it zooms into a specific boundary, if you see over here. So there's a, there's a non-linear function happening. It just like makes it a linear because it just goes specifically to that specific area and look at the other inputs and fix a linear model like a regression model over there. Um, the initial model may not be non-linear or it could be linear. And, but eventually what we're getting is a linear model out there, which, is, which we, we are getting eventually by zooming in. And it then looks at the other examples and just like tweak its, uh, uh, what do we call it, the linear model, and then compute the feature importance out of those linear models. It's simple, right? <laughs> okay, so, but like it, it looks simple, but like the maths behind it's like quite complicated. Like t it took me like a week to understand it. So I'm not going into that on the session. To understand how Lime actually does, like in a layman's term, like we, can, we can talk about it. Like it just like Lime perturbs the input data and generates a new data sets of the perturbed data, like the samples we're getting over there like this. And the intuition behind is to understand how the changes to the input uh, input features, like over there, can change the predictions of the model, which is like the simple generation. Then you have the predicted on perturbed model, which is like these samples are then passed to something like um, uh, another machine learning model, linear model, and the predictions are obtained for each of them. Then it becomes very simple because this high complex model with maybe like five, ten different planes, it just like converted into a 2D plane into a simple linear regression model or something. And then what happens is like weight assessment happens. We assign the weights to each of these perturbed samples. So how it's working is like the weight denotes uh, denotes the um, proximity of the the sample we are taking. And the closer the sample is to the original data point, the higher its weight will be. And it's typically calculated inside the kernel, so you don't manually do it. And then it's the model training. So Lime just trains a model on an interpretable model, which is usually a linear model, which makes it so simple. The only problem is like interpretability is so simple to do, but like the function, the thing they are doing behind the scene, it's quite complex, but it's somehow manages to make those complex into a very simple perturbed data set using the predictions obtained from those complex data set. And then the second one is the sharply addictive explanations. And it calculates the sharply values for feature. This is, this is an interesting thing because this uh, sharply values are completely based on uh, game theory concepts, specifically the cooperative game theory. So it represents the average marginal contribution uh, by every single feature into the, pro into the, uh, even, uh, the output uh, prediction. And this enables both the local explanation for the individual and the global insights for the feature importance. And this is also very versatile and it balances accuracy as well. Okay, so to, to understand it better, what the margin, marginality contribution is, let's say we have a game, there are two players, A and B, and player A has scored 10 points and player B has scored 20 points. And we can say like player B comes first and player B player A comes second. But what if they form a coalition and just like go together? So what's gonna happen is like the A's marginal contribution will be 10, but the B's marginal contribution will be 20, even though their overall score will be 35 and they will be the first in the race. But what we are trying to do with the Shapley values is like we find the A's and B's marginal contributions and this like average them over all possible uh, all possible combinations and this like giving them a fair credit. So what we are doing is like if there are so many features contributing all together, we just find the marginality cost, marginality contribution, and which gives us an approximate, not an approximate, al almost an approximate measure or the percent how much this uh, feature as a player has contributed to the eventual outcome of the model. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And the last thing we want to see is like the partial dependence plots. And PDPs are a way to interpret like the models 
<coughs> decision making process which we already talked in the beginning it gives like a feature relationship which tells you how one feature affects the predictive outcome um, arranged all over the uh, other features like some uh, you just like correlate two features and see like what is affecting the other and also gives you a global insights on understanding the models overall behavior and we can also think of um, maybe a real life example something like real estate agents if you know um, they need to understand like how much square foot impacts my home prices so this pro this uh, pdps can simplify that process and say like okay out of everything how much uh, your per square of price is just like making a drastic change in the overall price of the location and yeah so that is it for understanding the uh, explainable ai and what all those models work so maybe after this uh, uh, how much time uh, we are already 40 40 minutes right so we can take a 10 minutes break and meanwhile uh, you can open the uh, the PyCon Taiwan website go to this session and there is a link over there you can go to the link and download the uh, github uh, repository from there and there is a uh, Jupyter notebook over there so you can install it on the system and somehow just take your 10 minutes do it if it doesn't work there's an, uh, there's a link to Google Collab as well but Google Collab might have some issues on uh, showing you the graphs, all the graphs all together, depends on the GPU and all, but you can at least follow along. So all right, then uh, let me know if you have any questions, and but yeah, the first thing you should be doing is like just like go to the link, download it, and just like start running it, and if you are having some issues, let me know, I'll just like come fix it for you. Uh, shall we begin? Perfect. <coughs> Perfect. Okay, so um, if you see my screen, uh, I mean, if you if you if you if it's not being set up on your system, it's fine. You can just like follow me along on the screen. I'll be ex going through a bit. So we are short on time today. So uh, we'll 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 just like go through a couple of things just like quickly. So we are importing uh, a lot of libraries. Let's not go over there. It's just like import importing all those things, and the outline will be. We will be talking about class box models, then using Lime, Sharp, and the explainers dashboard. So what we are doing is like we are loading the data sets. The data set is basically of the people and the people who are making greater than $50,000 a year or less than $50,000 a year based on their age, work class, education, marital status, occupation, race, and so on. So what we are doing firstly is like we are converting those features into one heart encoding because we don't want them to be like only bachelors, uh, associates, uh, some college, masters, doctorate, education and all. We just want some numbers. So we just like uh, calculated the, the categorical columns, not the, the ones which are the categorical because work class has different ones because age is not categorical, income is not. So we just like skip them. And we're just using the functions of pandas.getDummies and just passing the data frame with the categorical values. So those those data columns will be converted into, uh, instead of just like work class, we have like the person is a part of the government, then it will be uh, zero, uh, not a part of the zero. If it's a part, then one, zero, one, zero. So everything has been converted in binary now. You can also use something like the, um, the ordinal encoders by scikit-learn. So it's all, all up to you. But like we're not using, we just like simply getting using the get dummies function, and then we updating the data frame with the one hot categorical one, one hot encoded categorical values, and then this is our final data frame which we'll be using now. Then we have a function which is basically doing giving us a uh, split of the training and testing data sets. So for those who don't know how machine learning works, it's like for anything you need a training data and a testing data set. So we're using directly the function by scikit-learn, the train test split, which is just like giving us a 80-20% of the testing and training data. Then we get those x-train, um, x-testing, then the y-train, y-test, and from this function by passing the data frame. And then we, what we're doing is like we're going with our first machine learning model, which is gonna be a logistic regression. So we're just like calling the logistic regression, but not from the scikit-learn package. We're using the uh, interpret ML. So this is, oh, not this one. 
interpret ml so this is a library by microsoft and we're making use of it because it helps you interpret those glass box algorithms if you go here you will see the glass box ones and some of the black box ones as well because they have their own implementation of lime which we will see how we can implement them so we we calling the uh, logistic regression function directly from there and not from the circuit learn library and what we're doing is like we're passing uh, the feature names which you're having from the training data. We are also adding the penalty and the solver, which is just like your uh, minimizing the cost function and the overfitting. Just like use it for now. And this fits your, <coughs> then we fit the training data. And this eventually fit you a glass box model from interpret ML. And similarly, you can use, uh, to just the test the accuracy and all, you can use other kinds of penalty like annual regularization, L2 regularization, elastic net, or maybe none. And then what we're doing is like we are getting the y, uh, the training Y prediction and seeing like how much um, our initial training outputs will be uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the trained data model. And on the basis of that, we get the accuracy, precision, recall, and the FN score. For those who don't know, uh, accuracy is just telling you the efficiency in percentage. Uh, precision is basically the true positives by uh, the total number of true positives, and recall is uh, true positives by the actual one are there in the true positive. So in short, we can say like how many items we selected are actually relevant to us, and how many selected items, are, how many relevant items are selected. And F1 is basically giving you a balance between the, the ratio between the precision and the call. And then we make the predictions on the test data set just to see like the model is pretty good, working fine. Then we can see how the inner working works. And we'll do the same thing. Plus we're also adding the AUC curve, which is the area under the curve. And what it's telling you is like how efficiently our model is able to identify the positives and the negatives. And anything between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 is considered very good in terms of your model. And above 0 0.9 is the excellent one. So we have, we're, we're doing just fine. And now what we're doing is like, OK, interesting. It just stopped. Let's, oh, OK, sorry for this. My Jupyter notebook just crashed somehow. So we'll just like overwrite. Let's see what's happening. This is so common. Like on your local Mac, MacBook. I don't. I wouldn't say it sucks, but like sometimes it gets stuck. Oh boy, that's. That's not good. Even my Mac got stuck. Let's see if I have opened somewhere else as well. Is it open? Is it open? OK. So luckily, luckily we have opened on our system, so we can just use it. So this is a backup plan which I had on my mind. I won't run it, because I knew my Mac will stuck at some point. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we, 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 we always should do this. So let's say we this is run. This was run like an, a, an hour ago when we started the presentation. So it's good we have still have this. So what we are doing now is like we are the, the logistic regression model we just like uh, fitted. We are going to ask the glass box model to explain it locally. So what's going to happen is like it gives you a graph. So a summary, we will never have a summary in the local one because we are trying to get the local, localized summary. So we'll have to choose like. So, so what we're doing is like we're not getting the entire one. Could be like I don't know how many I have to check. Like sixty thousand data points. We're just like getting the top thousand, only the top hundred columns, the, the rows, and we're just like seeing how much predictions we're getting. So we'll see like the actual prediction was zero, zero, and the predicted value was also zero. And what are the factors which actually contributed? So we'll see like the marital status if you're single it drived completely towards this, like you will have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry for that. You will have less money. That's the opposite. And if you're, mar if you're married, then you will save more money or you'll make more money somehow. So that's what this model says. I'm not saying that. 
the hour of the number of hours you work if you work more hours you will make more money it's simple just work more and and your age the more you are old the more money you have that's that's the model tells you and it also gives you a predicted score it's like oh okay it was 0.981 it's very strong you will also see some false positives here which is something let's see yeah so the actual one was 0.371 but the model said like hey it's 0.629 so it's highly positive uh sorry it's highly negative here because it was positive but the positive was that so actually we were like oh this guy actually makes more than fifty thousand dollars a year but our model says like no he doesn't work and what are the dr forces which are driving it's like his age was he was old some he was very old age 48 so we, we, we the model says like oh this is this is pushing it harder to being a positive one and the number of hours he worked was pushing it way too harder but then the other factors was like he had he doesn't have a very good college degree he haven't worked so like uh, gone through a master's or a phd postdoctorate and his occupation is a blue collar and this is something like this is something i was talking about the race like the gender biases which happens now it says like hey there's a race he was a white person so it's also pushing something why i don't know but the model thinks like so race is also a part of being your model and he's a male that's a gender bias which is we are seeing here it's also assuming like if he's a male then maybe he'll make less money over here or maybe more in our case it's like it's being a male is pushing it towards making less than fifty thousand new dollars and it says like his his work is private so eventually the model says it's negative it's pushing towards the negative one so he's making less than fifty thousand which is not true in our case so normally if your model would have said like hey this is the actual one this is the predictive one but how it says the it's giving you a false uh, answer this is how you can just like open that model out of and similarly we can see the global explanation by simply calling the explain global function from the uh, module we are using and this gives you a summary this gives you the coefficients like the what are the major coefficients which are contributing to your uh, our models outcome it's like all the negative one the the less than 50000 are been pushed by something like marital status single education only school you widowed you divorced but the highest one coefficients are giving to um, your education as doctorate and your education is like professional school so this is only the top 15 or something we are just like looking at but we all can also change it like how much you want to see and we can also see the correlation like uh maybe see something like um, age we will see with age your score contributing to it increases drastically it just keeps on going up the more older you're getting the more money you will make second thing will be going will be a decision tree so it's the same thing we are just like calling the uh, classification tree we're not again not using scikit-learn or any other library we're just using the interpret ml and the uh, fix we are just like calling the classification tree by providing the random state for and then you're providing a maximum depth of uh, five. Uh, oh, we are not providing a maximum depth here. So it will automatically go with the, um, uh, what do we call it? The standard one, which is used by clause. And then we have the minimum sample by the minimum split will be two, at least two of the split. We then just like plot it and we call the decision tree and then we evaluate the model. And we see like the AOC, the area under curve is 87%. So we know our model is doing fine. So we can now try exploring the model explaining the model further and then we have a confusion matrix which will tell you there are some false negatives and false positives here and then we try to interpret the model globally using the same glass box model so right now the model's explainability we are seeing is not uh, a black box it's glass box or the white box which we know the inner functioning and it gives you a similar one uh, in the in the local one um, uh, here it won't give you any because it will be giving you a graph instead of some uh, sorry the tree structure graph instead of a bar, bar chart kind of a thing and if we see like how much uh, professional school was a part of it and somehow it's n okay oh, it's there somehow it's there but it's so small so we'll see like how it has came to a specific decision here 
which is like it went to this node which says like hours are less than 42 then it went to this node then it went to this node and so on so this is how we have come to a decision like okay this is how our values were being generated the final outcome and we can also similarly generate the local uh, graph which is similar to the ones we have seen before it's like the actual is one, the predicted is one, and the confidence is 66%. And how we came to this conclusion is like, we saw like the guy uh, or the girl was married. So we saw like, hey, is the person a blue collar or not? We saw like the person is the blue collar job. Uh, and then we say like, what's the, um, uh, the high, high school, the, like the, the, the schooling or the highest level of education we see like, the, it's like the high school graduate. And then we see like, <coughs> it's, it, does it have an education or is this age less than 34 two conditions left one is satisfied and then we go down which is not visible here because oh, it's so small so it also calculates the impurities of the decision tree but like this is this is this actually tells you like how our model comes to our decision instead of just like blindly giving you like hey this is how it, this is the final outcome one or zero and then we have the explainable boosting machines, which we saw like we just like cuts down into smaller, smaller pieces like histograms and eventually compiles them all together. So we train the ABC. We don't have to do it. We just like call the explainable boosting classifier by interpret ML again. And we just like passing the random state so that the random values are just generating behind the scene. It's like a random seat, which you normally use so that the random numbers, pseudo random number generated should, sta should be stable every time you put the same values. And then you fit the model and you return it, you are training the model here. Similarly, we will evaluate the model with nothing uh, different than just like, just predict, let's get the accuracy by the accuracy score, classification, the, uh, the report, which will give you all the F1 scores, uh, recall and everything. And then you plot the confusion matrix just to see like how many false positives or false negative your model is just generating now. And then you see like, uh, there's some false positives and false, some false negative, but Let's not talk into this because our main goal is not to make learn how to make a good model. Um, our, our sole job is like to see how we can open up those models altogether, and then we can again uh, generate the explanations, and it's very much similar to that. We will be saying like the predictions, like what are the predictions which uh, pushed it towards less than fifty, and what are the predictions which pushed it towards more than fifty. So here we will see like. Uh, the major uh, push we're getting is from the negatives one, like the less than 50,000, and the, uh, eventually the our overall predicted class is also zero, and the uh, confidence is 97. And it's the same thing. It's like the global uh, coefficients here, like what are the major factors? So we'll see like the marital status being married are rich, so married people are rich. Age is a different factors. If your marital status is single, it also contributes, but it comes below your married status, and so on. So far, like you keep down, you keep seeing other other features. Now comes the lime, like the local interpretation model, and what we are doing is like for the lime, we're going a bit further. We're not going with a very simple classification model like a decision tree or something like a logistic regression. We're just going to a random forest, which is a perfect example for the ensemble models, which takes uh, so random forest behind the scenes, uh, for those who don't know, is just using decision trees. But instead of just one decision trees, it's taking so many decision trees. And from the training data, it just like splits it internally and just like keep passing them values on different decision trees and gets the prediction and gives you overall predictions from the highest number. So that's how it's more accurate than your normal decision trees. We are using the random forest classifier from scikit-learn and passing it the estimators at 100, random seed at 40, maximum depth at 6. So we're giving it just 6 because we don't want to make it computationally more complex. So just for the sake of this, you can. it's up to you how much you want to see and it's up to the model performance, how much it's performing at what level or what depth. And then we plot the feature importance, like uh, what are the most important features. So we'll see like this is what we are doing so that we can see what are the features which are random for this directly tells you on a broader level and then we'll compare it with the black box uh, explanation how we can how uh, openness is there like is this model is actually giving you the right information like this these are the uh, variables the features which are contributing the most 
So what we are doing is like we're just like uh, sorting the indexes in ascending order, then retrieving the features, which are just the column names, and then we're creating a horizontal bar charts where the gradient, so that like, we see like what's the lowest to the highest points, like a curve in terms of a bar chart, and then we're just like adding some labels. And similarly, we have done the evaluation before. We're also evaluating the random forest model here, which is just doing the same ROC curve, ROC AOC curve, plus uh, the, the reports, which is F1 score, P call, and the confusion matrix. Then we train the model by passing the training in the testing data set. And then we see the importance features. We will see like the, it says the, the marital status, married is the major factor for saying like, hey, you are making more money than age, than hours of work, and come like so far, it's, it's going in the ascending order from top to bottom. And here is the score which says like, okay, the model is pretty good, and then we can actually go and open the model and see how the explanations are working now. And this is how an ROC curve actually looks like. I want to show you like <laughs> how much, if it's, up, if it's pretty going, if it's not like uneven, then it's pretty good, I would say. And now we are doing the lime thing. How lime works is like we are uh, imp imp uh, like calling the function lime tabular explainer from lime. So what is happening here is like uh, we passing the number of uh, test values into the NPRA as the as a data set. Then we have passing the uh, training labels, which are basically the uh, the labels of the outcomes. Then we have the feature names, which are basically the names of the columns you are just like passing. And then we have the classes because we only have zero and one, false and true and false. And the mode should be classification because we are going for the classification model, not a regression model. And the kernel width is three and the random state. So three is something which is like the, uh, the neighborhood parameters. You can tweak it, but like for the sake of not making it complex, we are just like using it pretty simple model. And what it's showing you now is like it's doing the similar thing, but now it's also giving you some specific uh, probabilities like 0 0.09, 0 0.11. Occupation profession was uh, contributing 0 0.07. Hours per week was this. The major contribution was coming from the marital status. And the, this is the 0 one. This is the for the feature one. And you also got these uh, values and the features like what's the values uh, you are passing in. If it's a bachelor, yes, hours a week, and so forth. And you can also make use of the list parameters. Like you can also print the list if you want to make use of this data and just like put in uh, together into something else. And yeah, that's pretty much how Lime works. Lime just like opens up your, uh, zooms into specific things and gives you how much uh, 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 percentage of, of the probability is being, uh, is drive is driven by those specific features into the overall outcome, and then we have also plotted a uh, a, a, a chart uh, like a small graph, which is basically telling you, like how much is the contribution coming from the less than fifty thousand and the more than fifty thousand. This is just for the explanation. It's more or less the same. It's like if you're not able to understand properly the above one, you can see like you have a higher. Uh, chances of like the 50,000 one, so we're getting this. And we're also getting it for the si a, a, sing a single value. It's not something for the, the entire value. You can see over here, the index value. This is a specific uh, out output for the index 10. So you can always change this to 11, 20, 30, 40, whatever to see like which uh, localized index you want to see, which curve you want to see the outcome for. And then we also using, because the, when you're using the interpret ML before, Lime is also a part of it. They have put up an abstraction level. If you are, don't want to make a systems complicated with Lime, you can simply just use your model. Then you use the principal component analysis over here for the dimensionality reduction because they need to make an abstraction level so that your data is reduced. And then you just like create a pipeline using the scikit-learn pipeline and then just like pass both of your models over there and then you fit the model. And this black box model we have created now, which is uh, we are doing this uh, because we are making it more complicated for Lime to understand so that we can understand like if, if two or three ensemble model models are coming together, can Lime still identify and give us the outcomes? So 
if we use this black box model and just like fit into the lime tabular this is not coming from the lime this is coming from the interpret ml and this will give you instead of that that weird looking uh this kind of old-fashioned thing you will just get a very simple bar charts for this which says the actual one was the predictor was 0 0.2 which will considered as one and these are the factors which contributed the most over there and this will know this won't have a global interpretation because we are completely going local here and we can also see like the text classification we, we all have already saw like how we can go with something like labels and all tabular data but like can we also classify text based on lime so what we're doing is like we're just like getting the news groups uh it's a pre-made model by scikit-learn i think uh, i forgot it's i will have to say and we just like call it and just like split and get the training and test data set out of it and then we do the normal TF-IDF vectorization. Um, if, you, if you have been familiar with NLP, so you know like how these text vectorization work or something like dagger words and CBAO, BBAO. And then you train your random for this with this uh, data set. You just like again using the ensemble model of random forest. And what we're doing is like creating 500 trees. It's up to you how many trees you want to create. So an estimate is will be 500. And then you similarly evaluate the text model again. And what we are doing is like, then we are asking Lime to, hey, we have uh, now using a, uh, a text-based model. So instead of Lime tabular explanation, we, which we used before, we're using the another kernel, which is being explainer kernel, which is provided by Lime, which is Lime text explainer. So we'll make use of Lime text explainer and then pass the value over, uh, where is it? um yeah over here so we just like passing the explainer to the explainer instance like explain the instance this is again coming from the interpret ml and then just like pass the test data and the pipeline models prediction probabilities and you just like say number of features should be six you can again increase them this is something i just used and this will return you the explanation so when we call this function uh we just like created the um we just like converted the text into the the matrix format the tf and the idf then put the product uh, of those matrices to get the tf idf and just like pass it to the random forest model that's what the rf model requires and we see like the, the accuracy is pretty good it's 90 percent the fn score is also pretty good so there's a complete balance and we also see like the false positives and false negatives have reduced completely down and this is how it's it's going to give you the outcome. It says, like, the true class is Christian. So we are differentiating between atheism and Christian. Atheism is zero, and Christian is one. So it's saying, like, it goes through this text and say, like, oh, there are so many things. Like, I don't know what this means. Okay, maybe this is 1993, something related to, I don't know. Could be, could be an error, could be an issue, could be a bias over here. We don't know. So ethos is just, like, contributing to the... Christian one, and then you have a thing. So it's randomly checking like, okay, you have God, you have Christ, you have Christ, you have God. So, so you are a Christian. <laughs> so that's how you can say like the machine learning model doesn't always give you the right answer, but now you know like why it has given me like, hey, this takes us more towards Christianity or something. Similarly, if you have something like images, which is a very interesting thing, like how you have image classification actually works. I mean, you must have seen something like uh, the OpenCV models, which just like gives, uh, annotate the image models and just like do something, but like no one knows like in behind the scenes how things are actually working. So we'll see it now. So what we are doing is like we're not training any model, we're just using the carers and just like uh, getting the intercept inception uh, version three. It's uh, it's a CNN model, if I'm not wrong, which is training on the ImageNet by Google. And we just like calling that pre-trained model because we can't train it like for the session. It's a, it's a huge model. Then we pre-process the image because the image size could be completely different. We want to bring them to our same level so that we have similar pixel values. Because uh, for those who knows neural networks, you need some. Uh, so how many of you know about neural networks here? So, you know, like uh, every single pixel is, is a part of your activation and then you put the weights and all. So every single image should have the same number of pixels here. So we are just like uh, uh, kind of like squeezing the image into a smaller one, 29 into 29. 
and then we also convert into grayscale so that the computer is able to understand the values more efficiently instead of RGB properly. Then we are uh, just using CV2 just to plot things out, just to read the image and write it out. And, and this isn't just for your insight, this will just like give you an insight on how the values are just like going on. And then we predict, oh. sorry for that. <laughs> Wait, where were we? Yeah, and sorry for this because this is this this turned out to be a huge uh, like a very long uh, notebook and sometimes it just happens. So we are predicting by just like calling the model the inception model we just like call from Keras and we just like passing the processed images so that we train the model now. Oh sorry, we predict the model. This process images is a long term which as you there's just one image, and then we are asking the lime to use the lime image explainer now. So Lime has another explainer which is specifically meant for images. You just call the Lime image explainer and then pass the image and just like uh, pass the, pr the model prediction and top labels how many you want to see and the if you want to hide colors either one and the number of samples. So these are like the per tube samples we already discussed in the, the normal slides like how per tube samples are created and all. And this is a function which simply visualizes for us because we want to see like, we don't just want to see like, okay, it's done. We just want to see like on the image, which all sections were actually, um, were, um, you know, um, were identified, classified as something. And we are just like calling the explanation get image and mask because this is a part, this is a function being called by the Lime image explainer and then we just like plotting it down. And this is, we just like uh, normalizing it. It's just like the interpolation. We always need values to be between some values, one and two, one and zero, or minus one and one. And this is some extra additional visualizations I've done so that like, instead of just like the positive one, we actually see like which parts were like so densely uh, marked as the value where it was so confident. So we also plotted the heat maps over there. So when you run this, we will initially see this is this dog image, a cute dog over there. And the height of the pixel, the, the height is this, the width is this, the three channels. And it just like runs the model and says, hey, it's a, I see a golden retriever, I see a Labrador, I see a Kuwas, I don't know what is it. I see a flat coated retriever, I see a tennis ball. I don't know where is a tennis ball. But yeah, <laughs> do you guys see any tennis? Oh yeah, maybe, maybe. But like yeah, so it's like the, the 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 confidence is so low, but the highest confidence is going to your golden retriever. And now what we're doing is like it's giving you the positive ones. Like this is how it identified that this is a golden retriever over there. And in the additional outcomes, we will see like okay, in the out overall image, this was the section which turned out to be the golden retriever. These were the most positive values. It was very confident about. It also contributed to some false positives here. But like that's why the accuracy was 97%. And the heat map, if we just like remove the image and just like think of something like a heat map, this was the region which contributed most the blue one for the positive result. So so let me have I think few more minutes. Let's quickly finish thing. Maybe we'll just like go five more minutes if you have time. We'll just somehow manage it. So we have Shapley. So as we discussed, we're not going sh into Shapley again. We have uh, using the same ra uh, random forest model, ensemble model we discussed earlier. We just like fitting it, uh, we just like checking how it's working. And then we see the feature importance again. And now we are just like calling the Sharp, Sharp tree explainer. So there are two explainers by Sharp. One is the kernel, one is the tree. Uh, for now, just, just, uh, just think of like a tree one is much, much faster than the kernel one. But, uh, and what we're doing is like, we're just like passing the random forest model over here and we're just like asking like, hey, just like give me, explain me the sharp values for the test ones and saying like, hey, the class one, the red ones are this and the blue ones are contributing to this much. So we, we can see like how much are being pushed for the positive one, but more than 50,000 and how much are just like pushed to less than 50,000. We can also create something like a summary plot out of sharp values. So which gives you something like, so these are all the values being plotted here. So these are small, small, small dots, but like overall they looks like some, uh, what do we call them, bee swarm chart. Uh, 
So this looks like a bee swarm, so bees happening there. So, bee, so the blue ones are just like pushing it more to the higher end uh, of getting, uh, sorry, the red one is pushing it more to the higher end of being positive and the blue is going towards the, one, the other one. So this is one for the global one where we are just like going for the zero one. So on the left hand, you will see like all the blue values. It's the same thing, but it's like, it's the inverted ones. If you are just like going for the global one, if you, go, if you say zero, you will have the more of the negative one on the left, otherwise you will have on the right. And now what we're doing is like, we, we're plotting another plot, which is basically we're seeing like, uh, what are the sharp values being generated? And if a predicted value is zero, what is the values being f driving the thing here? So we can see these are the these are the values which are pushing red towards the outcome value, the fun f of x, which is the output value we need, 0 0.73, and the blue ones are the one which is pushing it towards 0 0.73 from the right. So that's how we have come to a conclusion. That's how this plot, force plot work, which tells you what forces are coming and pushing it towards more towards your uh, predicted outcome. And this another one chart we can create is called a water, waterfall chart. And it also tells you the percentage increase and the decrease. Plus five is more like uh, how much it has added to it and negative five is how much it has taken away from it. So it's like, if you want 100 uh, Taiwanese dollars or something, if I'm giving you 50, but you have this person is taking 20 out of you, and so how much overall people are giving you, taking from back, and back from you, and eventually the, what you will have left will be your eventual outcome here, like the f of x. And then we have done what we are doing is like we are using the sharp instead of the random for this, we are creating a simple multi-layer perceptron, which is like the basic neural network. And we just like uh, training it from the uh, scikit-learn. We just like making a pipeline, creating a standard scalar and just like passing the MLP classifier. And then we evaluate that model. We generate the sharp kernel explainer. So this is where I wanted to show like why kernels are very slow. Because when you talk about neural networks, it just keeps checking every single uh, neuron one by one. So that's gonna be like, so, uh, sorry, the weights one by one. So you will see uh, down there, it has gone to five to one zero step and that, that took actually took a lot, lot, long time. And then we train the model, we found the accuracy, we call the sharp explainer and then we generate the sharply values. And here what we are doing is like, we're seeing like uh, what are the highest value driving. So marital status has driven something and so forth and so forth. Let's not go into one by one. So maybe after session, if you have time, you can talk to me or maybe you can just directly go through them. And the one thing also we, we thought like maybe of instead of a simple model, we can go with a gradient explainer for CNN because Sharply also provide an explainer called gradient explainer. So we again, just like using the MINS data set, which is basically your uh, handwritten zero one to the data set, which peop normally people start with when they learn machine uh, the neural networks and all. We're building a CNN model. I mean, um, let's not go into the, this basically just like layer by layer, we're just like defining them and the activation if it's a real or not. So we just like added the layers, added a dropout layer, and then we build the model. The optimizer, we're using this atom, and the loss is like this pass categorical cross entropy we are using here. And then we evaluate the simple model, which is basically we fit the model and we explain it with uh, sharply. And Sadly, this thing has not been generated. Let's see if it's, it's being generated here somehow. Oh yeah. So sorry for this. My system is like some some things have been built up on some on plots and something is not. So when we see the number plots, we will see like um, the characters on specific layers on this specific one. It it's giving you uh, like the red ones are more on the positive ones. Very positive. Like this is seven. Otherwise, it's just like not so confident about seven. So it's getting in different layers and it's telling you at what stage you are actually getting those uh, values. And because otherwise, when you're creating a neural network, you just know you pass in the value, some maths were happening, weights were being tweaking after every single layer and you get the output result. But like at what specific stage, uh, those things were actually giving more uh, preference to something you see on a, on a plot which has been given by Shapley. And the last thing we will see is uh, 
uh, transformer model. Um, sorry for this, because again, this is not working for now. I don't know. So it also tells you the same thing. It tells you like uh, if we give a text to a transformer model, we're just like uh, using the sentimental analysis. And the text we are saying like PyCon Taiwan is the best conference. And we say like, oh, th if we get a positive sentiment, then we can check for like what exact words were causing those positive sentiments. Like because we have the best ever. And so the overall outcome will show like a, a, a the sharply force plot, which tells you like, hey, this is the value which is going more towards the positive end. And this is the explainer dashboard, which is, let me quickly see if it's opened here. Uh, Oh, luckily, this is this is the one I wanted to show. Uh, this this visualization is like sadly not there, but like you still have the values over here, which says like fun is contributing to way too much for the positive sentiments, uh, is is going for the negative ones, and tutor is going a bit of the positive ones, and we can also see the 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 force plots. Like this is the value, and the majority you can say it's a clear win. It's like team red one from team B, clear majority and. They're just like pushing and contributing to the factors. And explainer dashboard is something like, uh, it's a tool meant for uh, opening these models, but you don't see them manually. You just like call it and you see a dashboard where you can simply navigate through and just like click and just see all those plots and everything by your own. It's not as efficient, but like something uh, better than nothing. So yeah, that's it. That's it for all. And thank you so much for joining. And sorry for this mess up in between. The Jupyter Notebook just stopped working. And yeah, it was nice having you all in this tutorial. Thank you.